Welcome to Beyond the Lab, a series by the Office of Career Development within the Biomedical Research, Education, and Training Department of the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. We're, my name is Kate Stewart, and we're so excited to have JT Brogan back. Um, Dr. Brogan, thanks for coming. You are a graduate of the Chemical and Physical Biology Program, 2013. Okay, so if you've been here at Vanderbilt for a while, you did your undergraduate work, and then you were here as a graduate student, yep, and you did a postdoc. Right. So we're excited to have you back. Um, Tell us about what you did when you were here at Vanderbilt. Um, so let's see, I, my undergrad career, I did a, a double major in English and chemistry. Okay. And um, that sort of started me down the road of kind of trying to bridge the communication side of things with the science side of things. And um, after my undergrad career, I, um, I went up to Phillips Academy Andover. It's a boarding school in Massachusetts. And I did a teaching fellowship there in chemistry. So I taught two classes of chemistry, um, had a fantastic year, and then returned to um, to Nashville, returned to Vanderbilt, kind of had to force myself back into the lab because yeah. uh, if I'd stayed away too long, I don't think I would have been <laughs> really interested in doing homework again and taking courses and, and whatnot. But I'm really glad that I did. Um, I joined Craig Lindsley's lab for grad school. And um, that was really a, a, a great experience. I'd done uh, undergrad research in Craig's lab okay. and I was able to return to his lab as a grad student. And that really um, set me on, on my path to continuing chemistry, but um, really looking for an industry opportunity at the end of grad school because Craig came to Vanderbilt from Merck. And okay. so our lab always had a serious industry um, uh, lean to it, if sure. you will. So um, we were always looking at, at our research projects with a kind of um, a hope for a commercial end in some way. That's not okay. a very nice way to put it, <laughs> like the, <laughs> the, the research that we did, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing now? So you're doing something interesting now. What are you doing? Yeah. So I work in regulatory affairs, CMC, chemistry manufacturing controls at Biogen. What is CMC? It is the section of regulatory affairs that, to, that focuses on the way that pharmaceuticals are manufactured and the way that they are tested. And we interface between the subject matter experts at Biogen who are in manufacturing and who are in QC and who are in um, these various fields that, that uh, work with the drugs, and then we write up the sections of the pharmaceutical applications and sort of liaise with the regulatory agencies like the FDA or the European Medical Association and all the different regulatory bodies around the world. You had an industry postdoc. Yeah. And that's interesting because there's a lot of people pursue academic postdocs. What is What was your industry postdoc like? So my industry postdoc was specifically geared towards preparing someone to be um, either in manufacturing sciences or in regulatory affairs, chemistry manufacturing controls. It's a two-year program that Biogen put together a few years ago to um, start training folks to be prepared for the, the experience-heavy field of regulatory affairs, CMC. Okay. So the first year of the postdoc, I worked in the, in the manufacturing sciences group, mm -hmm. which is the group at a pharmaceutical company that owns the manufacturing process So on from a scientific standpoint. So when, at Biogen, we focus primarily on biologics as a company. Okay. So um, in manufacturing sciences, so manufacturing sciences is a very important role within the manufacturing group at any pharmaceutical company. And there are really three sort of legs of the manufacturing sciences stool. The first uh, leg is the um, is owning the manufacturing process from a scientific standpoint. Okay. If anything goes wrong in the manufacturing process, the first group that the actual manufacturing group turns to is manufacturing sciences. So they wanna know, okay, we wanna troubleshoot this. The, there's something going on in the cell culture or in purification. We need to figure out what's going on and why. And the manufacturing sciences group is the group that goes okay. through that troubleshooting process. <clears throat> so that's what I mean by owning the manufacturing process. So the second uh, leg of the MS stool is uh, about um, tech transfer. So whenever a new right. process is brought into a manufacturing facility, it needs to be transferred in in every way. So the engineering that goes into the process, the automation uh, for the process, um, the growth media that cells use to grow in, every aspect of the manufacturing process for a biologic is so incredibly regimented and controlled. And the manufacturing sciences group is responsible for transferring that process in in every respective way so that the facility is, is completely ready to manufacture that product. Okay. And just as it was either done before or to bring a new product up from development that wasn't, that is yet to be on a manufacturing scale. Okay. So, and then the third component of, of MS is, um, MS is short for manufacturing sciences. Um, the, the third component is, um, 
continuous process improvement. If someone has a suggestion or an idea or a proposal is made to improve or augment the manufacturing process, MS typically will take that idea and run it in a number of different scenarios, typically small scale first, okay. um, and, and we'll vet out the idea in every way. We'll generate large data sets, write up protocols to, to test the concept, and then ultimately write up reports that detail exactly how the, um, how the proposal will impact the current manufacturing process. And that's a significant, that's the final component of manufacturing sciences. So I spent a year in MS in Cambridge, uh, at Biogen Cambridge, and I learned good manufacturing procedures, GMP, and then a lot of just the, the detailed components that go into biopharmaceutical manufacturing. And it's a really great way, it was a great way to learn and be and prepare myself for ultimately my um, second part of my postdoc, which was the year in regulatory affairs CMC. Got it. So um, because CMC is chemistry manufacturing controls, coming from a manufacturing background, extremely helpful. So I was able to take a lot of that knowledge that I'd gained from MS and transfer it over to the regulatory CMC. And um, that was year two. Okay. And in, in regulatory affairs, I focused on um, all of our currently approved products in Japan, which is really interesting because the Japanese market is incredibly different from the U.S. market and from the European market and a number of the other markets around the world in terms of the way that the regulatory process works. So I spent a year in regulatory affairs CMC working on primarily post-approval work to keep our currently approved products up to date, keep the licenses um, fully um, accurate for the manufacturing process as we wanted to uh, have it run. Okay. So, okay. So how did you get your industry postdoc job? Did you, uh, you know, the job search, how did you, how did you land it? Yeah, I, um, so when I came out of my PhD here at Vanderbilt, I was really interested in sort of marrying those two concepts of, of the communication side of, of my experience with the science side of my experience. And that meant some form of scientific communications role. And initially, I actually was, I wanted to learn what else is out there. And so sure. I conducted a ton, a lot of informational interviews. Great. And informational interviews are really helpful to learn about roles because I just didn't know what sorts of positions there were. And over the course of those informational interviews, I actually ended up speaking with a gentleman who was in research at Merck Pharmaceuticals. And he asked me, what are the things I was looking at? What sorts of scientific communications positions I was um, I was pursuing? And I mentioned that there were program positions like medical science liaison, scientific writing, scientific mm -hmm. publishing, and that there's a regulatory writing company here in Nashville. Right. And when I mentioned regulatory, he kind of perked up and said, look into that a little bit more and pursue it. And up until that point, I really hadn't given regulatory the time of day because I thought that sounds really boring. Yeah. It sounds like you're working <laughs> with documents all day. It just, that's not for me. Yeah. But when he mentioned it, he said, you know, that's a part of the industry that people are really interested in. People really want to break into, and it's extremely difficult to break into. So if you can gain experience, that's going to be really valuable. So I took his advice and I started looking into regulatory affairs a little bit more. And true, there was a regulatory writing company, a contract regulatory writing company here in Nashville. And I investigated that a little bit, but while I was at it, I kind of realized by the by way of putting in tons and tons of online job applications that I was not competitive for the roles that I was applying for. And that led me to the conclusion that I needed additional training in, okay. in the form of a postdoc. And so when I started looking for regulatory affairs postdocs or scientific communications postdocs, pharmaceutical development postdocs, I actually found that there are a few of them out there. And I applied for programs like there's one at USC with, it, with Allergan Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. University of North Carolina has a postdoc program with a number of the, the different biotech and pharma companies in North Carolina. And then Biogen has a program in Cambridge. So I applied for all three of these positions. and. Um, I received an opportunity to do, conduct a phone screen with Biogen. And the phone screen is a 30 minute interview. And I was actually interviewing with the vice president of regulatory affairs, CMC. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, it really worked out great. She asked me some really compelling questions. Um, Tell me about a time that you failed, right. um, things like that. Yeah. And so, but I was able to, I apparently did well enough in the interview that they asked me to come in for a face-to-face -face interview day. And that was an interesting process because it's a 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. day of interviews, 30 minute interviews with the entire department all day long. So you're literally on from like the moment you step on campus until four o'clock in the afternoon, at which yeah. point then you get to give a research talk to an entire audience of folks who are scientists for a living. So um, and then 
open up to questions and answers from the entire crowd. So it was a really intense day of interviews. But at the end of it, I felt really, I felt like I had done a really good job and I was really proud of what I did and said, you know, whatever happens, happens. And about a month later, which was an extremely long time to wait, <laughs> Um, I got a uh, word from the recruiter. He called me up for the Biogen recruiter and said, you know, congratulations, we've selected you. Um, you're one of the two candidates out of the pool of about 300 that applied. Wow, so great. I was um, really proud and really happy. And um, they wanted me to move from here in Nashville up to Cambridge in about two and a half weeks time to start the job. <laughs> so um, it was a really quick turnaround, yeah. but it really um, it's entirely opened up a, a career for me. So that's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. So. I want to go back to one thing you said. You did a bunch of informational interviews. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. I mean, those are, you know, wonderful for career exploration. Mm -hmm. What are some of your like things that you would always do in these informational interviews? Like, you're probably you probably got great at it. So, what are some of your <laughs> your tips for informational interviews? Okay, tips for informational interviews. I'd always try to write out a few questions ahead of time. Okay. I'd always try to ask them. You know, so um, one, how did you get your job? What do you do on a daily basis? Um, what are, if you could change anything about your job, what would you change? Kind of okay. trying to find out what the things that they didn't like about doing what they did. Right. Um, and um, overall, just taking notes constantly mm -hmm. because a conversation flies by really quickly and sometimes someone will mention something just kind of off the cuff. Sure. And that one concept that you, if you're paying attention, you might be able to pick up something or a whole different field, a whole different part of the industry that you didn't even know existed or would be something that you'd be interested in, but the someone they might mention, oh yeah, and you know, I occasionally work with this group at my company. And mm -hmm. you know, if you get to the end of the conversation, something I always recommend doing is trying to ask them, you know, is there anyone else that you'd recommend I talk to? Always yeah. trying to get at least one more name, someone else that you could kind of continue the the um, the conversation with. So um, those were things that I'd try to do every time. And actually, the funny thing is now that I'm. Um, have kind of completed the circle and I'm on the other side, yeah. I'm getting phone calls and um, emails from <laughs> current Vanderbilt students and postdocs <clears throat> asking me about my current role and about um, the biotech industry. And I'm always tell them I'm more than happy to kind of pay it forward because yeah. so many people were so great to me when I was in that position. How many informational interviews did you think you did over your course of your, even PhD training? Yeah, over the course of fourth year of grad school, my final year of grad school, I probably did uh, 20 or so. And then yeah. during my year as a postdoc, I did a postdoc at the Vanderbilt Center for Science Outreach after my PhD. And um, I wanted to stay here in Nashville because my wife was finishing grad school. And that was right. a really great opportunity to kind of teach, uh, kind of build on the teaching that yeah. I'd done previously and to, um, and to be physically present here. But during that year, that was the point when I was applying for my for the postdoc at Biogen and all the other postdocs. And um, during that year, I probably conducted maybe another 15 to 20 more. Um, so I, this is these are ballpark figures, but I, I have stacks of notes somewhere that I took. So <laughs> that's yeah. great, great. Um, so. An industry postdoc is different than being out in, you know, academia. What mm -hmm. are some of the things that you've noticed that are different about being in industry versus um, your training and PhD? Uh, let's see. Training? Well, first and foremost, my PhD was in was in wet lab research. Um, my postdocs have been um, entirely outside of the lab. So my teaching postdoc, I was physically in front of a classroom with students teaching, but that was a one year position. It was sort of a bridging position for me. My current postdoc, or well, my my most recent postdoc at Biogen was entirely outside the lab, except for actually the MS component where I actually had a significant laboratory research project. It wasn't so much research, <clears throat> but a process development project that I worked on. And um, so that's a, but aside from that project, I was working outside the lab and also working in a corporate environment is entirely different from working in an academic one um, in terms of the culture of, of professionalism, if, if you will. Going from the NIH minimum in terms of um, of compensation to a industry <laughs> postdoc position was also yes. really nice. That certainly was a, a major bonus of working in the industry. Yes. Um, and Biogen actually has a, a really fantastic program in that um, their postdocs are sometimes classified as FTEs, full-time employees. And that um, opens up a whole lot of possibilities in terms of being eligible for employee stock purchasing program where you can buy corporate stock at 15% discount. And so if you wanted to turn around and sell it the day you bought it, you're yeah. already <clears throat> coming out 15% ahead, very which is different. fantastic. <laughs> it's very different from, yeah. a, from, a, um, from an academic postdoc. So those are a few of the differences. Um, 
otherwise, um, there's a sort of culture difference in terms of there, there's a recognition for, of this person has a PhD. There's a, there's a certain amount of kind of weight that is given to your comments and your opinion because people recognize that you have a PhD, which in, while in graduate school, that's what we're all here doing is working towards getting a, gra- a, getting a PhD. But in industry, when you've got it, it's sort of like you're in the club. And that's, um, it's a really nice way to, um, a nice stance to have when you're entering the industry. That being said, I felt like I was constantly in a position where there's always more than I needed to learn. And I needed to learn it yesterday. I think uh, despite that, that kind of appearance of, of knowing everything because you have a PhD, there's um, kind of re- remaining, uh, making sure that you remain hum- humble is a really important thing. Okay, so you were saying there was a learning curve. Mm-hmm. You had to learn a lot of skills to get in. What were some of the things that you wish you had done while you were in training that maybe would have prepared you better for where you are now? Oh, God, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's amazingly, it's actually the soft skills. I don't think that there were things that I wish I had done while I was in training in terms of the science. Sure. Um, because I did actually get a chance to do cell culture in my fourth year of graduate school. I, I ran months of experiments in cell culture. So I had my own experience of working with cells, of growing them up, of working with growth media and things like that. And as a result, when I transitioned over to the cell culture team in manufacturing sciences, I had experience to build off of. And so that was really something that I felt like I came in at least knowing the the fundamentals, if not the finer details. And um, the things, the soft skills are the things that I, I worked on continuously when I was a grad, stu- grad student and as a postdoc, but they're the things that are just constantly in demand. And when I say soft skills, I mean you're constantly being put in a position where you need to speak about, um, speak publicly, speak in front of folks of, of varying ranks within the company and standing up in front of a room of directors and vice presidents and uh, delivering a presentation on what you've been working on and how it's going to actually impact the company is something that is nerve wracking, but at the same time, if you have experience and you've really worked on your, your public speaking skills, it can, um, it can go just fine. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something that I would, for any, any, uh, you know, trainee that's, that's looking to transition into industry, writing, public speaking, and I mean, even things like simple things, email is an incredible thing that I feel like so many people just don't put the um, the effort into it that they really ought to because when you receive an email from someone who's just kind of fired it off and there's typos in it and they don't have a you know uh, they're not even addressing the person that they're sending it to, um, you know that's that just shows a lot about kind of who they are and what their their uh, work ethic is about and on a, the corporate side of things that's a very rare thing and that's something I actually saw a lot when I was a grad student so okay yeah great that's great advice. We're so glad that you came back. Thank you for your time today, and um, we appreciate your time. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.